welcome spirit of God. Hallelujah, Yahshua. We're going to have one more song of worship uh, right before we go into the reading of the Torah. Uh, and then we will be going right into the service. Uh, by the way, too, those of you that would like to be a part of this Shabbat service in person, uh, email us at IsraelReturns at AOL.com and we will let you know how you can be a part of this. Blessed be His name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lo ira, maya asal na yadam. Adon ali be Yisrael, va ani yare ve samay. Lo ira. Amen. 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 
fear. Amen. We will wait upon the Lord. Yes. Amen. The Lord here. Blessed be His name. Let's go right into the reading of the Torah this morning. Um, and this is part of Shabbat service where we read from the Torah itself, the writing of Moses. And we're going to begin in Barashit, Genesis, uh, Aleph, which would be verse 1. And it says here in Genesis, Barashit bara Elohim et HaShemayim ve'et HaAretz, Hayata tohu ve'vohu, ve'choshek al panech tachum ve'ruach Elohim ar-chafet al panech ha'mayim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when the earth was astonishingly empty with darkness upon the surface, of the deep, the divine presence hovered upon the surface of the waters. Goes on to say, "Ve'yomer Elohim Yahi Or Ve'Yahi Or Ve'yare Elohim Et Ha'Or Kitov Ve'yavdil Elohim Ben Ha'Or Ve'Ben Uch Ha'Choshech Ve'yakara Elohim La'Or Yom Ve'la'Choshech Kara La'Ela." And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated between the light and the darkness, and God called to the light day, and to the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, day one. God bless you, and today, uh, this is our first uh, live broadcast uh, we are recording this to where we'll be able to post this on YouTube as well. So you may get a little bit different information on YouTube. And then this way, too, those of you that are not able to tune in live will at least still get to be part of our uh, Shabbat service that we, that we have here. Uh, so we trust it's going to be a blessing for you. Uh, and as I said, um, in future meetings, if you want to just email us at IsraelReturns at AOL.com, uh, putting your subject line would like to be a part of your service because um, we know there's quite a few people that live in this area here that have wanted to be a part and we would like to invite you to come and be a part of the Shabbat services here uh, as well as part of the live presentation. Uh, we're going to go to the book of Esther this morning and I'm going to read to you some uh, portion of the book of Esther um, and we're going to look at something that's kind of unusual in the book of Esther, probably something you've not thought about before. In fact, um, when the Lord began to deal with me on this here, I didn't quite have a clear picture as of what was going on, uh, but now I'm beginning to understand much better what is happening in this book here. Uh, we're going to chapter 3, and we're going to begin with verse 10. Uh, and this is where, uh, this is King Asaras here, uh, Haman, the wicked Haman as we know. Um, the king says here, Haman has tried to deceive the king in uh, wanting to annihilate the Jews. Now, King Ahasuerus actually is a type of Yahshua. He is a type of the Messiah. And, um, and we have to keep in mind if you think about it, it looks like in Genesis uh, chapter 3 when Satan deceives Eve, uh, it's almost as if God doesn't know what's going on, but we know better than that. 
we know that God knows exactly what is going on at all times. He's not, it's not like he doesn't know or he's not aware of what's happening. Uh, but when God comes in the garden and he says, Echa, Echa, where are you? Where are you? Adam, where are you? And the thing is, is God knew exactly where Adam was. Um, but God knew that the scripture was going to fulfill itself a certain way. But we have here, it says, And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, the, the Jews' enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Now, isn't it interesting, the enemy of the Jews today is none, none other than the Pope of Rome. And any Jew that has any spiritual ability whatsoever knows this. They know this for a fact that the Pope of Rome is the enemy of Israel. He is the Edom or the Esau of today. And this is believed amongst the Orthodox Jews um, but I thought it was fascinating because the king actually gives him his ring. Satan, when the fall happens in the garden, actually gets dominion over the earth. And this is why Yeshua has to come and buy, you know, pay the price to, to redeem uh, us, his children, upon the earth. And, um, and of course, the silver as well. It's interesting about the silver because the Vatican has the wealth of the world. And isn't it ironic that the Pope wears a ring on his finger that the world leaders and the spiritual leaders of the world, when they come to him, many of them, as they bow to him, they kiss this ring. Uh, this, now you guys that are watching on YouTube will get to see that because I'm going to show you some of the images of that. Uh, but I just thought it was fascinating that he gives him his ring. Now, as it goes on, we know the story here that what Haman is intending to do is to annihilate the Jews. Well, we find in the book of Revelation the same thing when Satan was wroth with the woman that was going to be delivered of the man-child. Of course, the man-child is Yeshua, because Satan knows that through this Jewish people, this is the way God was going to bring Mashiach. This is how God would bring the Messiah upon the scene. And when he couldn't take and kill the child, then the Bible says he goes after the remnant of the woman's seed. This is good for my Jewish brethren that do not seem to know the Christian Bible very well. It do you good to know because you need to realize that the, 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 the attack that Satan is, has on us as Jews is, is a planned attack. And he's been given a right to make this attack because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. But the one, the man-child, Yeshua, that was to come on the earth and everything is to redeem us back and is going to turn the table on this whole situation. Now, uh, as we move down into this, uh, we find out... Uh, Let's just kind of skip down a little bit. Let's go down to verse 14. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given to every province. This was when Mordecai, excuse me, not Mordecai, but Haman had made the decree to kill the Jews in every province everywhere that they're able to raise up against them and to destroy them. Now, look back in, over the last 2,000 years especially when the house of Judah went into exile. God says, and let me just take you to this uh, scripture here. Uh, so just kind of bear with me. I did not mark it, but it just comes to my mind for a moment here. Uh, the book of Hosea. Um, and I want to go to uh, Hosea chapter 5 is where I want to go to. Now, Hosea speaks of the redemption of Israel, but in particular, um, I hope I can find this without a lot of delay here, because uh, we are on a live program. Uh, but anyway, in Hosea, Hosea actually, um, that's what happens when you use a, King James Bible to do your study with you. 
Everything's backwards. Okay, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. I will go, this is, this is Hashem speaking, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my, uh, excuse me, and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Now, then goes, God goes on in, in chapter 6, verse 1, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. Now, according to Hosea, God has done this. Well, we know that God is not the one that has smitten Israel in their affliction in the, in, in the time of their, uh, the diaspora. However, he's given permission to Satan to afflict Israel to take and bring her back to repentance. You know, and, and for Jews, we cannot think this a strange thing. We know that even in the Babylonian captivity, we went in, according to Jeremiah the prophet, according to our sins, we were driven into captivity to be punished because we did not put God first in everything that we do. And so this is what happens. We go into captivity as a result now, it says uh, in verse 2, chapter 6, And after two days will he revive us, and in the third day he will revive us and up, and we shall live in his sight. So in the third day we have life. For the house of Israel, almost 2,800 years now, have they been in captivity. Now, that's, keep that in mind, because you're going to find out that when, the, when Mordecai finds out about this, and this is in chapter 4 of, of Esther, and Mordecai perceived all that was done, and Mordecai rent his clothes, put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out uh, into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry, and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. This is what we are as Jews today. We're coming to a place of sackcloth and ashes because of the bitterness of the bondage and every evil upon every side is upon us. Here we are in our homeland gathered once again. You know, think it not strange, my brethren, that all the evil from the Vatican and the world coming against us when we're in our homeland. God said that when we went to our homeland, He would never again uproot us again. As Benjamin Netanyahu quoted at the, at the United Nations meeting, and it is true, we will not be uprooted again, but we are going through a birth pain like never before. And it is prophesied to be that way. So Mordecai, he's at the king's gate and he's weeping and mourning. And he's lamenting. That's why we see in Micah 4 that we're in travail. So it's nothing strange or unusual. It's something that must happen. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that, that was given uh, at Shushan, so the, uh, the story of them to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go into the king to make supplication unto him to make request before him for her people. My Christian friends, do you realize the place that God has brought you to be? When you think of the bride of Mashiach, the bride of Yeshua, Paul said, I have espoused you a chaste virgin unto Mashiach. Your job, your place, your purpose in this life is to go before Yeshua to cry out for the life of Israel. You see, Israel cannot go into the presence of God because she's in sackcloth and in ashes because of the evil that is being done to her by the Vatican and by the rest of the world that has come against her. But isn't it funny, though? It's Mordecai. It's a Jew that recognizes this. It's not Esther that recognizes it. She, she, she gets caught in to be married to the king. Why? Because Vashti, his wife, does not want to be seen with the king. And I know many scholars think that Vashti, you know, that she was actually a good girl. She didn't want to be 
paraded before a drunk, bunch of drunk men. But it had nothing to do with drunkenness because the king says in the recording of Esther's story here that the king said that the, every man was to, be, to, to drink according to his own pleasure, not to be drunken, but according to his own pleasure. And they were gathered, uh, uh, every nation that was there. This is a type of Pentecost. This is what you were seeing. You were seeing a type of Pentecost. That's what we were saying. And at Pentecost, did they not come out and they were staggering like drunken men and did not the multitude say, these men are full of new wine? But Peter standing up in the midst of them all, he says, these are not drunk as you suppose they are. That's the same thing with the story of Esther. It was not a bunch of drugs. It was not a drunken spree as you suppose it is. This is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel. In the last day I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You know, so the thing is, what was fascinating is what we assume in the story of Esther they were guilty of back then. No wonder why the people think that Vashti was just going to be paraded around a bunch of before a bunch of drunk men. God was showing us in tight what was going to happen many years later. And so Vashti, when she refused to come out to be seen with the king, that's exactly what Israel did. She is a type of Israel when the Yeshua came and when the Pentecost was fully come and the Spirit of God was poured out upon the believers. Israel nominal, those that had been chosen to be God's wife, because that's what Vashti was. She was not engaged. She was the wife of God himself, but she refused to come out and be seen with this drunken spree that was going on in Israel. So then the king takes and he ends up separating from his wife. You know, it's interesting. He doesn't divorce her. There's not a single place you can find where he divorces her according to the word of God. But he separates from her is what he does. Now, in doing so, then he sends out to all the virgins of the land. It has sent out a decree to bring in all the virgins of the land. Now, that's kind of interesting as well, because if you think about the, the, the writings in the Christian Bible, what it says that there were ten virgins, five were wise, five were foolish. Does it not also say many are called, but few are chosen? There's your Esther. See, you, as the Christian you are God's Esther. And God has called you to come into his presence to plead for the life of Israel when the Pope of Rome is there to condemn her. That's why, why do you think that, it, that, that, that God shows you in the story of Esther that the king gives him his ring? Satan was given dominion over the earth because of sin. Haman represented sin that came in. Not only is he given the ring, but he's given the silver. He's given the wealth. So anyway, we find out. Then uh, Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it. Uh, uh, then was the, excuse me, let me back up just a little bit. Where Mordecai, Mordecai finds this out. He's weeping before the gate. Uh, verse 3, uh, chapter 4 in Esther, in every province within uh, whosoever the king's commandment as decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved and she sent remnant uh, to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. You see, you have to understand this is not something that, that, that was happening in Israel today. We cannot satisfy this with a financial donation to Israel and to think it's going to work. We cannot dress her in, in, the, in this word of the Bible and expect that she's going to wear it. This is going to be something that God is going to have to resolve. Resolve. 
So she sends this out to him. So, so uh, Hatch went forth to Mordecai into the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given to Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her and, and, and the charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. You see, you are spiritual Israel. It is God has called you to cry out unto Yeshua to let him know the evils that are happening. This is what God has called you to do. You're to go in before Yeshua and make it known to him the evils that are happening, what the Vatican is doing. This covenant that is going on, do you not understand that the covenant that is happening right now? This is the document. You see, Mordecai had a document. Israel signs a covenant for seven years. And that's the hour that you're supposed to recognize what's going on and to go before the king. And it's interesting when she goes to, to, to we just kind of skip down for time's sake. But when she gets ready to, to go, she goes in. Now, the thing is, you have to understand, she is going to do this upon death. Because to go before the God of Israel, unsummoned, is on pain of death. I find it interesting that she calls a three days, a three days fast. And you may not realize that, but why a three-day fast? It's because... Israel had been nearly 3,000 years a house of Israel with no spiritual food whatsoever. So God has her fast for three days. Showing her what Israel has gone to for nearly 3,000 years. Without the spiritual food that is needed for life. Do you remember when Yeshua says he, the multitude comes in and they, had, they were getting ready to leave and Yeshua says that he needs to feed them? It's when he feeds the multitude and he takes the little fishes and the bread and he said, I got to feed them. He said, they've been fasting for three days. They're weak. And if they go home now, they'll faint along the way. All of this is laying in there to tell you a story that's been hidden through the entire Torah the entire time, and we just didn't realize it. It was because Israel for nearly 3,000 years has been without food, and she's at the point of perishing because of it. And so God himself will come and deliver her. But then the queen, and we're going to close here soon, the queen, when she goes before the king, says, and she uh, going to the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him. So she does the three-day fast. Let's go to verse 14. For if thou altogether hold, the, uh, this is where Mordecai is talking to Esther directly. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think, uh, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. You see, my brother, sister, we can't think that just because that we're Christians that, that if we neglect Israel right now in the time of the most important time of her life that God is going to just give us life. We have been brought here for a purpose and we must fulfill that purpose. So let me just share with you right here what happens. So Mordecai says to her, don't think that you're going to escape just because you're in the king's house. Or if thou altogether hold thy peace at this time, then shall their uh, uh, in, the enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou, thy father's house, shall be destroyed. And, uh, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? 
This is the hour that you were born. This is why you are the bride. You're here to cry out for the life of Israel. You know, when Haman comes into that court and she prepares that banquet and Haman is allowed in that court, do you know why Haman is allowed in? Because the word of God says, and let me just show it to you so you'll know it. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to the apostle Paul, the, 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 he says, Know you not that you shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? This is why Haman was permitted there in the presence of the bride is because she will judge him for the evils that he's doing to Israel right now and all the hosts that he has, all his hosts, it's all of his little workers, the Pope of Rome and, and all these other illegitimate bastard children that claim to know Yeshua that have joined in with the Pope. You will judge them and the evils that they are doing to Israel. God bless you. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Let us worship the Lord in closing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Yahshua. Hallelujah, Yahshua. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam V'gam Ani Ohev Ocha Gadol Me'ad, Yahshua. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam